light the fires and kick the tires. <laughs> All right, everybody, good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to our work session. This is our regularly scheduled work session for Monday, November 14th. And we'd like to start off with agenda item number one, Historic Preservation Commission applicant interview. And we're going to start this off with William Reese giving us kind of a qualifications. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, before we begin the uh, interview process, I just wanted to point out uh, a little bit of a technicality that we have. Um, so because we are a certified local government, uh, we are required to have a Historic Preservation Commission that is made up of uh, at least 60% of the members do need to be residents of the city. Um, and because we are uh, currently interviewing for a regular seat and an alternate seat, it's important to note that the uh, regular seat, uh, because we have currently have four out of the six um, members are residents, uh, in order to meet, keep that 60%, the uh, the regular member will need to be a resident of the city. The alternate position can be a resident or a non-resident. And so um, it's just important to, to make that note before we begin the interview process. Thank you. And we'll start with our first applicant, Catherine, if you want to come up and have a seat. And if you would tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your qualifications and background about why you would be a good member of our commission. Good morning, thanks for having me. This feels a little awkward with a... Yeah, you have to hold that microphone. microphone right against yeah. your face. Yeah, can you hear online? Okay. <laughs> Catherine Stroh, I live, I'm the one that lives out of city limits, just south of the city limits on Ranger Road. I've lived here just about three years. I'm the executive director of the Colorado Historical Foundation. We do a lot of kind of business and financial tools regarding preservation. So I think what I would bring to the commission is sort of that 30,000 foot view of what historic preservation is all about and some different maybe objective ideas of how to accomplish different goals. I am a little bit less familiar with the city, but really love living here. And, and part of why we wanted to live here was the Main Street area and some of the, the history of the area, the really diverse history of the area that really attracted us here. So. Happy to be here today. Any questions from council? So how long have you lived here in Montrose, in the Montrose area? Just about three years. And what do you think is the most appealing part of living in Montrose? Oh, the most appealing part to me is, is, is location, just within all the different, um, the geography the recreation opportunities and the different communities, not only within Montrose, but surrounding the area, the whole region. All right, well, that's right. Application, I was really impressed with her qualifications yeah. and her knowledge. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming in and talking to us and telling us a little about yourself. Thank you. And our next applicant is Darlene Morrow. Good morning, Darlene. If you would, tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your qualifications for why you'd be a good applicant for the historic commission. Okay, good morning and thank you for having me here. Um, well, I'm Darlene Mora and I am a native, uh, bilingual, by culture. Um, I have lived in Montrose all of my life, um, North 9th uh, Street. I think it should be named after me. <laughs> Just joking, but anyway. Um, I became interested in uh, just preserving uh, Montrose history and because I am um, native here, I just would like to help the city and the council and anyone else that is needing my assistance to, to work together. Any questions? So what particular thing do you think you would bring to the council for the, the uh, preservation commission. My history here in Montrose. I know a lot about Montrose, and I know a lot about the north end of town and the city itself. Um, like I said, I was born and raised here, and I can tell stories all the way back from Morgan Elementary and Johnson Elementary School, where it was McDonald's that one time. So if anybody knows that, probably Ed. Um, I have a lot of history. 
I know a lot about Montrose. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? Thank you. Appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, moving on to discussion item A, land use code revision update and progress report. This is planning manager, Jace Hawkwald. Uh, good morning, council. Yeah, just for the record, Jace Hawkwald here, planning manager. I think this is the first time I've formally spoken in front of y'all, so it's exciting times. Um, so I just wanted to provide kind of a quick update as to where things are at with our comprehensive land use code update. Uh, you all have probably been uh, aware of kind of where things have, have been over the last six months or so, but I'll provide a quick update and then I'll actually hand it over to our consultant team um, who's on, on Zoom. Um, so as you may be aware, we've contracted with Martin Landers and Jerry Dahl to actually work on this comprehensive land use code update. Uh, yeah, like I said, both Martin and Jerry will give more detailed update here, but I really wanted to discuss the approach that we've been taking over the last couple of months, particularly since I jumped on board with the city. Uh, really what we're looking at is kind of a two-phase or two-prong approach here. Uh, phase one is really going to consist of consolidation of the land use sections into one chapter. Uh, that's really easy to navigate. So if you've looked at our land use code now um, and or know developers who have, they might have expressed some confusion as to where to find some things. So the biggest component right now is really consolidate, make it easier to read for uh, staff, developers alike, uh, really across the board. So everyone's just generally on the same page. Um, another component of this phase one portion is gonna be to update some areas of the code to confirm legal compliance uh, with state and federal laws. So um, obviously as we update this, uh, we wanna make sure that we're in compliance with some uh, larger um, just legal components um, and, and that's important for phase one. And then lastly um, is to add, add a use table. Uh, which is gonna be great for staff as well as just the general public to look at what uses are allowed and what particular zones. Right now it's just listed in a narrative. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand and there's uh, redundancy in some sections. So we're really just looking to make it more readable for all. So that's really phase one uh, of it, and, and that'll likely, uh, that'll come to work session again once we actually have formalized red lines from our consultants, and we're well on our way with that, but once we have kind of the full update, we'll bring that back to work session, likely uh, close to the beginning of 2023. Um, so, Again, that's phase one. We're looking to kind of move, move forward with that pretty quickly. There's not a whole lot of controversial changes with that. It's really consolidation. Um, following phase one though, um, which again, we're, we're looking to, to probably finish up and have to counsel and finalize for hearings in sometime in the spring of 23, uh, probably early spring. We'll actually dive into phase two of this code update. Uh, this is gonna focus on some more substantial changes uh, within the code to really align it with the city's comprehensive plan. So as you're all aware, the comprehensive plan was recently passed. Um, in the not, not too distant past there. And we just wanna make sure that the code is actually reflective of that comprehensive plan. There's some components right now that, that aren't that we'll certainly be looking at, um, particularly as it pertains to zoning districts, uh, plan development standards, uh, and, and some other things. So as we get uh, closer along to phase two, we'll certainly bring these kind of, uh, these, these hotter button items to you in work session format. Um, obviously we will look for direction from city council at the end of the day as to what we wanna see. Uh, we just, I just wanna keep you in the loop now as to how we're viewing this um, from a kind of phase one, phase two standpoint. So that's the general process uh, city staff and the consultant team is taking right now. So you'll see this, this phase one consolidation uh, come to you pretty soon. And then phase two will, will likely be kind of closer mid-year next year as we look into some things. And we'll certainly get a lot more public involvement uh, with phase two as we look at some of the real substantial changes to the code. So, uh, 
And that's another component. So we're going through a housing needs assessment, as you're all aware now. Um, and we, we really wanted the data from that housing needs assessment to really kind of guide how we're looking at the phase two component, how we're looking at you know potential changes to zoning and, and some other components, certainly as it pertains to housing, which we all know is uh, is, is a hot topic these days. Um, and certainly me moving to the community, I'm, I'm more than familiar with that as well. So uh, that's that's a big piece. And we're well. expecting the results of that in April? I believe that'll be spring. Um, so it'll, it'll likely be, yeah, I, I would say March. Closer to March is what the consultant team has, um, has reflected to me at this point. So with that, um, unless staff has any more to add, I can go ahead and just turn it over to uh, Martin Landers and Jerry Dahl who are online here and they can uh, give us their, their feedback and process moving forward. Well, thanks, Jace. Um, first of all, I wanna make sure everybody can hear me. Yes. Yep. And uh, that I'm sharing my screen. Yes. Correct. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I always want to make sure those two things right off the bat. Uh, I'm Martin Landers uh, with Plan Tools, and with me today is uh, Jerry Dahl uh, with NDBR. And uh, we're working together uh, with staff on uh, preparing a new unified development code for the city. Um, I know we last met uh, back in May, and uh, since that time, uh, of course, there's been a number of things that we've been working on. Uh, what I'd like to do first is kind of give you a little bit of refresher about the project objectives and, and then move into some of the things that we've been doing since May. Uh, well, first of all, um, and I think as Jace mentioned, you know, really our task here is to reorganize the city's land development code and ver uh, various regulations uh, that are kind of spread between various uh, documents into a unified land development code. And I'll talk about that here a little bit more in a minute. Um, we also want to establish rules and processes in a user-friendly format that is legally sound. Uh, Jace mentioned the charts, the use chart, being able to take, for example, all the various zoning uh, uses that are listed in each district and, and put them into a single chart. Uh, we have done that, we're working through that. Uh, but that's just one of the things that we want to do to make sure that the new code is one that's very easy to access, use, and interpret. And then uh, finally, we want to address a variety of different uh, update items that have been identified by uh, city staff, as well as that are listed as items within uh, the Montrose Comprehensive Plan that was adopted uh, a couple of years back. So in terms of the, the very first objective, uh, we certainly want to reorganize the current land use code into a unified development uh, code. And so what you can see here is that your current Montrose regulations manual and your Montrose municipal code have a variety of different sections, all addressing uh, different types of, of land use issues. So again, the, the point there is that we want to pull all into one code document that is easy to access so that folks don't have to be searching throughout uh, various uh, titles of the municipal code are going to actually to a separate document uh, to find some of this information. It all should be in one place. Uh, what we have done is proposed a, an outline here uh, of 15 different chapters under a new title uh, for, the, um, for the municipal code. Um, and these chapters that you see that are highlighted are all ones that we have completed drafts of to date and have submitted to staff for their review. Uh, we are about 50% complete on the uh, definitions chapter and probably I would say close to 75% complete on the zoning chapter as well as the uh, development review procedures. Uh, we're only about 25% or so complete right now on the land subdivision and site development. But all of these are in progress. Uh, there are a number of issues that have come up uh, that we want to present to you though today uh, before we continue moving forward on, on refining some of these chapters that we've already put together. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry Dahl to talk a little bit about uh, three key issues, wireless communications, group homes, and off-premise signs. Jerry? Thanks very much, Martin. I hope everyone can hear me as well. Yes. Yeah, we've got you. Thank you, and delighted to be here this morning. Thanks for 
letting me zoom in on kind of a cold morning. In any event, uh, yes, these are three sections that we find that that for most of the codes we update, we do need to to pay special attention to because of in part uh, federal statutes and case law <clears throat> that have really impacted uh, how local governments can address these three categories. Uh, let's take up wireless communications first. I think I've got a slide on that, right? Um, here's what we've done to the code. Of course, wireless communications are cell towers, right? Cell towers and increasingly small cells. Um, the industry, the wireless industry uh, has a really great lobby, especially a federal lobby. And as a result, uh, that has resulted in the requirement for local governments to react to kind of the federal regulatory program, which has some preemptive components. But in any event, what we uh, have done to the regulations to date is to consolidate them. They were a little spread out. So we've done that. <clears throat> Importantly, we've added these required processing deadlines. Under the federal statute, you've got to, when a cell, cell facility, when a wireless provider wants to put up a cell tower, et cetera, or a small cell for that matter, uh, which is like a mini cell tower, and we've all seen them, I'm sure, uh, you're required to process that in a timely manner, and they have certain deadlines that have to be met in terms of time. Those are not bad deadlines really in terms of the amount of time for local review, but it's important to plug those deadlines into the regulations uh, because if uh, you don't act on, say, for example, a small cell uh, application within the required time frame, it's deemed approved. And we don't want that. So we want to be able to apply our land use regulations to these facilities within the federal deadlines to make sure we still have impact. Um, specifically, we added um, review of small cells and networks, and that's really where the action is increasingly, especially with 5G. You see these single little tiny, you know, there can be a monopole, there can be something on a utility pole that really functions to provide service locally. And less and less, we see the giant, you know, big cell tower that is more of a regional um, communicator. But the small cells are really how this uh, material is delivered, this service is delivered to all of us. And increasingly, we need more of it because we're all running videos on our phones. And that takes a lot more uh, in the way of, of facilities out there to be able to deliver that. I want to make a specific point about location and spacing. Uh, this is something that's come up because of uh, the law, which requires that small cells are uh, uses by right on public rights of way. And so we've seen these crop up mid block and we've seen them crop up in front of people's homes in the right of way, which is really disturbing to people. Uh, nevertheless, the, the lobby has required that we allow these facilities and local governments have responded and we have done so here with restrictions that say, okay, that's fine. We know you get to be in the right of way, but here are the rules for that. You've got to be on common property lines, for example, extended out into the right of way so that it's not in front of somebody's living room. Instead, it's on the property line and a whole lot less impact uh, to the uh, to the property owner. Ideally, we'd like to be able to say none of these in the right of way. But again, that lobby has been pretty strong and has um, provided for the facilities in those locations. But we've done what we can for location and spacing requirements to be able to reduce the impact of of that. So that's kind of the thumbnail sketch on wireless communications. Uh, group homes, another area in which there is a federal law and some state law as well around group homes for handicapped and disabled persons. The law is really clear ever since the Fair Housing Act amendments of I think 1992 that uh, group homes for the disabled must be allowed in residential districts uh, in roughly the same manner as residential uses for single families. Uh, the theory behind that and the social policy, honestly, behind that is that uh, disabled residents ought to be able to live in a group setting and feel as if they're in a neighborhood just like anyone else. And the, uh, the federal law and the case law is pretty strong on this. Interestingly, there's not a number at the federal level 
and there's cases in law all across the country, well, what's the maximum number? Because at some point, you can appreciate a group home really becomes an institutional facility. Uh, and, and that shouldn't be something that you allow mid-block in a residential neighborhood. There's no question that these can be very controversial when a group home for a recovering drug addicts or alcoholics is established in a residential neighborhood. There's a lot of local neighbor concern. So what we have done, uh, and I've done a lot of these regulations, is established as an upper limit eight persons. This is consistent with a state statute requiring local governments to allow group homes for developmentally disabled persons up to eight in residential settings. It's declared by state statute to be a residential use of property. And so it's not a situation in which you can say all group homes have to be in a commercial district. Uh, you do need to allow these in residential districts, but with limitations. And eight persons is a really defensible upper number. Uh, plus which these homes have to comply with, as I've indicated here, health safety, parking codes, and some other codes. But the idea generally under the law, and I want to give you this news, is that with up to certain size numbers, group homes for disabled persons are, need to be allowed to be in residential districts no differently than a group home for a large family or for that matter, a small family. And that's, that's a function of the law that's not going away, but there are aspects that you can regulate and we have done as much as the law allows to permit that, to reduce the impact on the neighborhood. Uh, that's group homes. I think we've got a third topic we wanna to raise with you and that's off-premise signs uh, and sign regulation generally. Uh, of course, we have the first amendment and government can't tell you I can't regulate your speech. That's hugely important. It's it's something that it's an it's a it's a right that's exercised and has been exercised a whole lot right up until uh, last Tuesday, uh, as as we all know. And we all are proud of this, and we we want to support the First Amendment. We have to support the First Amendment. Uh, and in fact, laws in derogation of the First Amendment are unconstitutional, and that's fine. For many years. Uh, communities regulated signs, however, by looking at what the sign said. Okay, that's a political sign, so here are the rules. That's a real estate sign, so here are the rules for that. Well, uh, in 2015, the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision in this Reed versus Town of Gilbert case, said, well, now, wait a minute. If you have to read the sign to know how to regulate it, you're regulating speech. And you can't do that under the First Amendment unless there's a compelling governmental interest and there's no other way of, of regulating that. And that's a really high bar that you, that's very impossible to, to overcome. And so we have scrubbed all of the content related regulations out of the sign code and relied instead upon sign types. If it's a wall sign or a roof sign or a yard sign, you don't have to know what's on the sign, do you? to be able to say it's a roof sign and therefore here are the rules for a roof sign or here are the rules for a projecting sign. Uh, and that has worked really well and communities across the country have embraced that approach and actually made it, I think, easier. At first we thought the sky was gonna fall because it changed how we regulated signs for years, but we have found that it really is, is workable um, with one exception and that's off-premise signs. Because how do you, you know, the only way to typically, municipalities especially, would prohibit the use of off-premise signs. Uh, so a sign uh, advertising my auto uh, repair business uh, on someone else's property downtown, but advertising the business uh, outside of town or really anywhere else in town besides that property, uh, municipalities have typically wanted to prohibit that. How do you do that? without reading the sign. So we came up with a bunch of kind of awkward workarounds that didn't work very well. But more recently, there was a, a, a case that made its way to the court in, out of the city of Austin. And the court actually allowed and languaged to support the regulation of off-premise signs and the ability to prohibit off-premise signs by looking at what that sign actually advertises. 
goods and services not provided on the property on which the sign is located. And so we've we imported language right from the Supreme Court decision to be able to be as defensive as possible to allow that one exception really to the you can't read the sign to know how to regulate it rule. In other cases, we for everything else, we put together the, the sign type approach, which is really pretty intuitive. And I think people prefer it, frankly, to the uh, to the prior uh, approach. So we've added that definition. <clears throat> also, interestingly, in the existing code, there was an exception for this collective identification signs for churches and service clubs. And of course, you have to read the sign to know, don't you, that it's that kind of sign. That's a First Amendment violation. And you'll be interested to hear it was this kind of sign in the Reed versus Gilbert case, which is a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, that, that generated that case. So that caught my attention. We've removed that. We have a, put together a vigorous uh, and strong sign code regulation that is now consistent with this uh, federal case law. So that's my thumbnail sketch of that third uh, issue. And you will see all these these forms of regulation appearing in the draft code that, that we're, we're working on. Martin? Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, so yes, all the documents that we have been working on and the ones that I noted that have been completed, there are 10 of them now, 10 different chapters of the 15 chapter Unified Development Code are now available for public review on the project website. And the website itself uh, has a link uh, on the city's website. So if you go to the city's website, you can find this project website. So in addition to being able to review these different documents, uh, individuals that um, have any questions or concerns uh, can contact us. And we have a form for doing that here. So that's just one additional way that we can get people to um, contact us or let us know if they have any concerns or issues associated with the work that we're doing while it's in progress. Uh, I should note that one of the additional things that we're planning to do is to have a public open house event once all the draft uh, code chapters are completed. And that would probably fall in spring as Jace or Josh, <laughs> Jace was noting. Uh, in terms of our schedule, uh, you know, we've gone through the, the whole code diagnosis phase of this project. We completed that. We've obviously now working through the various updates to different chapters. We anticipate having all 15 chapters now completed by the end of the year. And as, as Jace mentioned, we're going to be moving into the, the code adoption phase in January when we're going to have an additional uh, city council work session to go through any additional issues or, or items regarding the, the code we're preparing. Uh, those draft documents um, are all being prepared in red line form so that you can see the changes that are being made from the existing code. And this whole process of adoption involves uh, work sessions with uh, the city council, uh, going to uh, the planning commission, showing them what uh, these documents um, are all about, um, having this additional uh, opportunity for public review and a public open house event. Um, and then moving forward through the hearing process. So again, we anticipate being completed with this phase of the project um, by the spring of, of next year. So with that, um, I know that uh, I think we've used our, uh, come close anyways, to using our allotted time today. Um, so if there's any questions that you might have or, or comments that you have, we'd, we'd be delighted to hear them at this point. I think we don't have any questions at this point because we don't have all the information necessary to ask good questions. But I think it's important for us to be able to review those documents in their draft form. So I appreciate that. And we look forward to seeing all of this come forward in the uh, spring. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye, Martin and Jerry. Thank you very much. This is Ann. <laughs> all right. We'll see you soon. All right. Moving on to item B, the 2022 Supplemental Budget Review. This is <clears throat> Finance Director Shaney Wittenberg. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, yes, it must be November and almost Thanksgiving because it's time for us to look at our budget and make sure we have enough. Um, you know, throughout the year we make some changes or we add um, different things. So we just want to ensure we're going to end the year without going over budget. 
So the ordinance that you will have in your packet on December 6th is ordinance 2606, and it includes um, seven different funds, eight different funds that we recommend a supplemental budget for. Um, I included in the packet a worksheet that gives you a explanation in column H, um, and I would be happy to go through those if you would like me to, or if you have questions about those, I could give you more details. A few more details? Anybody? I was just curious as to, and I think we discussed this before and I've probably just forgotten, but um, I noted that the uh, Mira budget was increased from 440 to 832, and I know you've explained that before, but would you mind repeating that? Uh, I don't know if Shania has more details than I do, but the... The microphone. Thanks. Of course, nobody else wants to use that microphone after you. Just you might as well keep it there. Yeah, sorry, Ben. Um, <laughs> if Shane, you might have more details off the top of her head than I do. I haven't reviewed that lately, but um, I think everything we budgeted was based on the anticipated projects that we know are going to take place based on our city engineers' input, the developers' input, contractors' input. Um, I don't know if you have a breakdown of that specifically, what that is, but I don't. But I could get it for you. Okay. Well, it's on primarily page. just more projects than what were originally anticipated. Oh yeah. In general, with all of our business development initiatives, we we try to budget. Um, the only exception would be we budget all of ARPA funds because we have a timeline um, based on the federal requirements to obligate those funds. But otherwise, we try not to use up too much budget capacity and so we take things on as they come to city council or the ura board or staff and then we talk with the appropriate board or body or dart uh, for facade renovations those types of things so those we'll see aren't budgeted a lot of times because we don't know those projects exist but we don't want to turn down opportunities as they come along and so we will see those in a supplemental form at the end of the year. Just in general, that happens a lot here at the city with our business development initiatives. If that's what, it, does that answer your question? In, yeah, in I general? just thought it was important to put on the record why there was this, and, such a large increase in the budget. And on page 10 of our, our packet, it, it shows that for the er, uh, incentives for horizontal improvements such as water, sewer, storm sewer, and sidewalks. It shows that, that explanation yeah, of that. Yeah, I would seen that and I'm just, my assumption was that, fortunately, we had more projects in the works than what were maybe originally anticipated in the beginning, and we're, we were uh, accommodating those additional projects. Or they crossed over into the next year. So right. sometimes we'll budget it in one year due to contractor delays, uh, supply chain, just uh, weather. Things will get carried over to the following year as well. That's another reason right. for those things. Okay. Correct. I was going to say timing of some of the projects. We don't always know what the timing is going to be. Yeah. So, no, I don't need to know the detail. I just wanted to put on the record the explanation. Sure. So basically, uh, uh, these uh, additional funds for Mora are uh, actually for any new project that may come up and not specific to anything that, that's uh, uh, existing right now, now or, or that's uh, soon to be existing. I think we can talk about details. Scott's coming up, which is nice and handy. I appreciate that, Scott. I think these ones are actually tied to expected, uh, an expected project. Yes, yeah, so all the funding, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, all the funding, um, so there's really no new projects. These are all just implementation of previous projects that some of these have been going on for two to three years. And then the burn rate of the contractor, those dollars hit at different times. Um, and they're on the private side, so we don't really control when those dollars hit. So it's really not any, as far as like this year's supplement, those are really implementation of projects that have been in the pipeline already and just making sure those are funded as those um, dollars are coming in or as those bills are coming in, if that makes sense. Okay, i just uh, trying to figure out, uh, it was my understanding at the last uh, uh, more meeting that we probably wouldn't need any funds for the rest of the year. Uh, at least that's yeah, it's not like but new, my regulation. New projects or new debt to the URA, these are just funding the 
ones that have been previously approved sometimes two to three years ago. Uh, okay, so this is existing projects that, that are continuing to be fund and uh, they might have been approved we're basically in 21, just catching, we're but basically then just catching the budget up to the reality of the situation. Right, because some of these projects have, have been uh, ongoing for before I even got on the council, so I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Perfect. Thank you. I think, I think, can you guys hear me? I think it's important to understand that this isn't the point we're approving those projects. The, we already approved the projects. This is simply approving the supplemental budget. So we did review those projects and agree to spend that money. Thanks, That's Barbara. It. And your your feed is lagging, so just so you're aware. <laughs> your bandwidth yeah, must be mud bandwidth I, must be low. I have really yeah, my my internet isn't great. Perfect. All right, any other questions or comments about the item about the supplemental budget? I think we've got pretty good clarification on that. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on to item C, recommendation for vector number 361, jet vac repairs. And this is utilities manager, David Breeze. Get the mic over here close enough. Uh, again, this is um, basically to give you guys a heads up uh, that we will be having some that we'll be having some um, major repairs on our one of our vectors. Um, back in September, uh, we had one of the blowers, which is basically what powers the vacuum part of that jet vac system, that it had a catastrophic failure. And, and so we um, took it up to va uh, Ferris Equipment, or Ferris Machinery, which is the representative that um, services our vectors. And they've been working on cost estimates and, and repairs and stuff, and have come up with the cost of about $100,000 to fix it. So this factor is also in the process of being replaced. Um, last year, or this year, in this year's budget was a replacement for this factor. We just missed it by a year on having a functional factor to sell. So we looked at, you know, what would be the impact if we said, let's just not fix it and sell it like it is. Well, from the um, information from the vendors and stuff, it's basically scrap metal at that point um, because of the, all the specialization and stuff, it would cost somebody more money to <clears throat> remove all of the equipment to repurpose that truck um, for something else than buying a junk that more junked out stripped out truck already so and then if once we fix it we believe there's a resale value about hundred and fifty thousand dollars so it does make sense for us to fix it from an economic standpoint um, as well as um, the repairs should be done to it um, either late this year or the first part of January of next year um, which is several months earlier than we're expecting our the replacement factor so we'll have use of this one for several months, plus we believe that we can sell it for more than what the repair, the difference of the repairs and the salvage value as it sets. Um, so our recommendation is that we um, move forward with the repairs and at, at about $105,000, um, and then we'll be bringing that back for formal approval um, here in two weeks. So, David, do you think, and I'm going to kind of include Mr. Scheid in this as well, uh, you've done a lot of thought about this and you feel that we're going to get enough use out of that remaining six weeks or, or whatever period it says, says six weeks in the document. You feel that that value is high enough to really kind of rationalize and validate the repair on this? Yeah, I think the combination of the resale value, because we will resell this um, once our new factor comes in, plus that additional six, six weeks warrants that repair and gives us that best value. And there is a market for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the estimated arrival of our new vector is in 
you know, April, May, but that is estimated. And what we have seen recently is that that's unreliable. And I definitely wouldn't guarantee we have a new vector by April. Um, it could be the following April at this point. We've had some, we've seen some major delays in equipment and vehicles. And so even though it's projected for um, springtime, that's definitely not guaranteed. Really until it's here, we don't know when we'll get it. Do you feel that this repair work will take us through a long enough period that the truck will still be in good shape to be sellable when we do get the new piece of equipment? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It'll be better than it was prior to this happening. Uh, I know in uh, previous years, uh, the some municipalities have actually uh, used their vacuum trucks to help rescue people that perhaps may have been trapped in trenches and stuff like that. And if I'm not mistaken, at one time I believe the city had some kind of a, uh, an agreement that in case uh, something like that were to happen that they could be called up to help uh, uh, rescue uh, somebody that was trapped in a trench. Because I know sometimes uh, driving around town, I see some of these trenches that are fairly deep, that are more than five feet, that, that don't have the proper shoring on them. So uh, I think that uh, as a benefit to the community, uh, that uh, if we were to continue that, uh, I think that uh, it, it's uh, money well spent uh, to save just one person that may be trapped in a, in a trench. Yeah, and we've, we've actually done some um, tre trench rescue training with the fire department, um, and they're aware of the equipment. Oftentimes, depending on the stability of the ground around there, the additional vibration from the, the truck and stuff raises concerns for them. But again, that would be some of their decisions, their, their call to make, you know, um, we would make that equipment available or as well as operators and whether that was a, the safest and bet most effective piece of equipment to use for that would ultimately fall on their shoulders. But it's a moot point if we don't have one with a, a working system, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think they're actually a good emergency response vehicle in lots of ways, maybe not only trench safety, but um, plugged culverts, plugged sewer. I mean. There's a lot of emergency response that, that piece of equipment is very specialized for. Very good. Are there any other questions? Barbara, anything? She might have stepped away. All right, moving on to item number D, the North Townsend Waterline Easement Swap. And this is a tag team between Ben Morris and the birthday boy, Scott Murphy. How do you know? There's three people in the city with a birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. We're not going to sing to you um, unless you want us to. I'm okay. <laughs> we should try. <laughs> That's what the problem is. We go try. <laughs> um, so this figures in your packet uh, should be pretty quick. Um, Um, okay, can you hear me now? Uh, figures in the packet should be pretty quick. We, this is 1330 North Towns, and this is just north of the San Juan Bypass. Uh, it's a drywall supply yard. Most people know it as the movie rental store from back in the day. Jim smiling. <laughs> Good old days. That piece of the north is Airport Road running east to the west, um, and then goes along in front of the uh, hangars there. Um, so the city is working on upsizing. Um, you can see that line to the middle of this drywall supply yard labeled as a six. That's a small six inch AC water line. Uh, the city in the past has worked on kind of upsizing uh, portions of the line regionally to get better uh, fire flow to this area and meet continued growth and demands. Um, there does remain a small, well not small, um, several thousand foot long six inch reach, kind of a bottleneck through the area that we're finally looking to replace. Um, in order to do that, we generally don't like water lines to the middle of people's property. Um, they built it this way, actually under the Montrose Industrial Water Company, way back in the day, um, when this area was a little less developed. Um, so we're looking to relocate that along the eastern property line, which is beneficial for the property owner and beneficial for us. Um, so we're essentially looking to do an easement swap. So we would have them grant us a new easement along the eastern side. Um, and then once the new line is built, we would have them vacate the old easement. 
So that old line becomes obsolete. We don't need it anymore. We can just abandon it in place and the easement itself. Um, so because that's a, you know, giving up an interest in property that is a ordinance by council. So I'm just kind of priming you that that piece would be coming. Um, and then in order to keep the kind of sequencing to work, we have an MOA. Are we um, working on an, an MOA with the owner that says, you know, you grant us a new easement, and then as soon as we finish the water line, we will vacate the old. So even though council would have considered the ordinance, um, we would wait to record it until um, we actually vacate the old line and then, and then record the um, abandonment of the old easement. So I think with that, that's the extent of my legal knowledge. I'll turn over to Ben if he has anything to add. Not really. I think that's an excellent summary of what we've done. We prepared the documents, uh, worked through the drafts, and I think at this point we're just waiting on things to happen out on the ground, and we need a title report still. So that's from the legal side, unless you have any questions for me. Just a, a question uh, for my own information. What is the blue line and the six stand for, or what is it? Um, so it's. Uh, so that's the existing water line, so it's a six inch diameter. Um, so they, that's just off of our GIS labels. Um, they put numbers on the various diameters of the various pipeline sizes. So the existing line that runs through the middle is a six. Um, the new line will run along the blue shaded area on the eastern side of that figure. Uh -huh. um, it's called out to run the new water line. That'll be a 12 inch diameter. Okay, I was just curious because uh, at one time I was doing some work on that uh, one corner uh, next to the uh, auto repair. And uh, they didn't locate it, but they accidentally found some kind of a, of a internet line that went to the airport that, or went to the towers. And thank heaven I was down there with my hand, shovel digging because, you know, I, <laughs> something. And uh, it, it turned out to be something that went to the airport. So just, There's a lot of utilities in this area. Yeah. So it'll be a really slow going project. Um, probably the most congested corridor um, we will have ever worked in. Um, we're doing so, it in-house. Uh, so it's something you would need, oh, I don't know, a vector truck for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't, they didn't locate it. That's why. Yeah, uh, yeah there's, it's a, there's a lot that runs down that airport road corridor because it's really, nobody wants to go in town because it's really hard to get utilities in town. So everybody went to the, just like us, yep. to the uh, first opportunity on the back. Um, Perfect. Any other questions? You. I think one thing to add, there would be no compensation, or we're proposing no compensation, I'm working that through with the owner, it says the new is about the same bought area as the old, and it's beneficial to both, so. Perfect. Excellent. Any other questions? No, Barbara? Nope. All right, moving on to item number E, City Hall Relocation Project Contract Amendment Recommendation. And Jim Scheid. Good morning, Council. Um, so yeah, this is for the phase two portion of the City Hall project, which is in the former Wells Fargo building on Main Street. We are currently working on phase one right now. Um, FCI Constructors is our CMGC on that project, and they are actively working, making great progress already. Um, it's actually really exciting to see how quickly it's moving along. Um, but this portion of what we're um, what we're requesting today is the um, amount that's been included in the 2023 budget. And it's, we're here early, um, basically as early as we can be, knowing that um, we're approving, we're in the process of approving the 23 budget right now. Uh, but upon, upon its approval, uh, we would like to be able to amend our contracts for our CMGC to continue moving along with the project. So uh, we don't want to lose any efficiencies in um, not having um, contracts in place for those contractors that are on site now. They're working on phase one and would like to be able to, as soon as possible, have uh, contracts in place for them to continue their work and move straight into phase two. Um, one is we don't want to lose the efficiency of certain contractors um, leaving, waiting on contracts to be in place to return. Uh, we may not be able to get them to return. Um, and then also just for a completion timeline of uh, still on that goal of, of February completion, uh, ready for um, relocation. And to make that happen, we need to get these contracts in place and keep our contractors rolling. So that's why we're here um, as early as we can be uh, for um, asking for the authorization of the 23 budgeted amount to include into our contract um, that we have in place now with, with FCI mainly. 
Um, this phase two includes um, other items as well. There was the FCI contract, which is the biggest portion of it, um, but there's um, a handful of owner-provided items, um, as it, like the asbestos abatement, which that's already complete, the roof replacement, which is actually starting this week. Uh, we got really lucky there, and our um, contractor we hired was able to get the installation, and um, they're on site this week. So that's a big win. But uh, furniture, things like that, are provided by the by us as the owner, and those are uh, also included in this um, phase two or this uh, 23 budgeted amount. Um, so we're making good progress. I think it's has been a very high-paced project. The CMGC process we're using has has allowed for that. Um, we actually just completed our um, construction documents in uh, mid-October, um, so that's uh, what we're able to work off of as far as um, actually performing the work. Um, and because of the process we use, we were able to um, start demo of the existing um, inside even prior to having those, those documents. So this process has been really, really good and has allowed for this quick pace that we're, that we're on. Does that change the occupancy schedule? No. <laughs> nice try. Yeah. Good effort. No. Uh, yeah, just for clarification team. for the public, we've already seen all this amounts. We've mm -hmm. seen all of these uh, line item and, and very detailed contract uh, and uh, construction documents. We've seen all of this. This is just because the pace of the project is moving very well and very quickly to make sure that we have that contract award in place yep. early enough to make sure we keep that. Uh, accelerated pace of play. Yeah, it seems like we just talked about this because we did. It is uh, was discussed as part of the 2023 budget, um, and now we're asking for authorization to be able to use that budget. So it's kind of back to back, right, right here in these last couple of months. But yep, keep it rolling. Um, but yeah, we're trying to just keep it rolling and um, roll right into phase two. Um, and as part of this, also we are um, continuing work on the concept level design of the exterior facade of the building, and that would be a future phase three, we may call it. Um, but we are working on the concept of that. Um, hopefully in the next couple months, we have a, a concept that we can discuss with you all. And um, with a concept drawing, we should be able to get a rough order of magnitude uh, of cost and uh, an open for discussion. But that's uh, something our design team is, is working on right now. But just for clarification of the record, phase three is also approved in the 2023 budget. No, I don't so believe we, 23. We approved the facade in the 2023 budget. Um, we, no, I don't we think we did. We requested the accelerated process on it. But we, since we don't have any construction documents, we don't have a line item or an yeah, amount. It's not in the budget. It'll come before you as a supplemental. supplemental. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We but, didn't have enough uh, data yet. To, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we're, yeah, but we're moving forward with creating those documents to give us that data, to give us numbers. Right. But yeah. we did request that right. it, it yeah. be kind and of we should, accelerated. And that's what we'll be able to get off that concept level drawing is just kind of an order of magnitude that we'd use as a budget. And again, we'd bring that to you as a, um, a, as a recommendation or request and, right. and then potentially include that as in a 23 project. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Barbara, anything? All right. Very good. Moving on. General City Council discussion. Gentlemen? Barbara, anything? I don't, but I tried reconnecting to a different line. Any better on the connection? Yes, much better. Great. Okay. Now that we're done. <laughs> I think I'll be I think I'll I'll be online today and tomorrow for sure. So Perfect. Great. Um, one thing actually that did come up in my mind, and I'm and this is something to perhaps bring up at a future work session and to give us time to actually research some of this is recently passed legislation, as Mr. Dahl was mentioning, that some of the past legislation is helping us inform better decisions. Uh, some of the recently passed legislation uh, includes the medicinal, medicinal use of psychotropic actives. <laughs> <sighs> I'm curious how that's going to impact us, and I would love to have legal kind of now that that legislation has actually been approved by voters. There's a couple of other items also that I would be curious to see how that impacts us here locally and kind of be, give you a plenty of heads up for an opportunity to maybe do some research on that for us and then find out a little bit more what that means for us. And we can maybe bring that to a future work session so we have time to really dig into that. 
Yeah, doesn't that go in effect into 2024 or something like that? And that's what I want to find out for yeah. sure. I want to find out exactly when it uh, hits and how it affects us. Because one of the some of the legislation, the way it was written into the the uh, election document, was concerning to me. So, I'd like to clarify. <laughs> I'd like and to find out what CML has with that as well. We yeah. can look into that. Yeah, the legislative staff that. is going is working on that as well. But I think I would like some more Montrose specific information. Okay. So, if you don't mind okay. digging into that for us, that'd be awesome. All right, staff comments. Anybody want to throw themselves under the bus? Should we sing Happy Birthday to Scott? <laughs> oh no, he's, he's, he's giving us the big head shake. All right. I, I have one, one uh, small update um, at the October um, Project 7 um, board meeting. Um, we made a selection for the design build of the, um, the new water treatment plant. Um, and the, the Project 7 staff is currently working on contract documents with McCarthy and um, CDM Smith for that design build as a joint venture. Very good. And I wanted to I'll kind of jump back a second. I just noticed outside the front in the window I'm seeing our city staff hanging Christmas lights. And I love it. I'm so excited. I'm wearing my Christmas socks today, just so you know. <laughs> yep, it, they're on. <laughs> All right, with nothing else, then we are going to adjourn. Thank you, guys. And we do have a. Uh, Special session following this, but we're going to take about a 15 minute break and we'll get back to our special session in a minute. Thank you. Barbara, I hope your father's doing better. If you can hear me, I guess not. <laughs> no, I can't. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, he's uh, out of the woods. 